Welcome to Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River's Autumn Lecture Series, The State of the River, Its Health and Ours. Before we launch into learning more about the state of fish populations in the North Fork, I want to thank you all for attending. And for those of you who don't know, Friends of the North Fork is a nonprofit based in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley, working to keep the North Fork clean, healthy, and beautiful through advocacy, community action, education, and science. It has been doing so since 1988, and it runs off of volunteers and membership. So if you aren't a member, we encourage you to see what we're all about and join friends by visiting fnfsr.org. Today, we are hearing from Jason Halliker with a talk entitled North Fork Shenandoah River, uh, State of the Fishery Fall 2021. Jason is the District Fisheries Biologist for the Department of Wildlife Resources, or DWR, and has worked for DWR for 17 years. He manages the majority of the warm water resources in the Shenandoah Valley, including rivers like the South Fork Shenandoah, North Fork Shenandoah, and the Main Stem Shenandoah, as well as impoundments like Lake Frederick, Lake Laura, Lake Arrowhead, and Lake Shenandoah. He is passionate about outreach and can often be found at events, introducing the public to fish from our local resources or on DWR social media channels to help educate the public about DWR's many programs. And I actually first met Jason at an outreach event where he was showing people fish with his hands. So that's pretty neat. <laughs> In his spare time, he enjoys playing hockey, beekeeping, and restoring pollinator habitat using prescribed burning. His program will cover recent fish surveys conducted on the North Fork Shenandoah River. Thank you all for attending and let's get into it. If you have questions throughout the lecture, please put them in the chat and Jason will respond to them at the end of the presentation. All right, thanks so much. You got me okay? Give me a thumbs up. Yes, excellent. All right, excellent. Man, I should have uh, saved that bio. That was pretty good. I, I write new ones every time I'm asked for one, but I, that might be one of my favorite ones. Very comprehensive. I kind of forgot that I wrote it, and so some of these slides will be a little bit of a repeat right off the start, but uh, thanks for having me. Um, I do enjoy talking to the public about our resources because we do have some fantastic ones. Uh, they do have their issues, as you well know, um, but I'm excited to talk to you about what we're finding on the North Fork Shenandoah River. So um, I've been working for the department for 17 years. Uh, over that time, I was mostly an assistant fisheries biologist. I've only recently become a district fish biologist. With the assistant job, it was really cool because I could work uh, all over our district, uh, not just within certain watersheds. And so I got a lot of experience working with other fish species beyond just the warm water species that I manage now. Uh, and just for your information, uh, we're in region four and that area covers all the land north of Richmond and basically the I-64 corridor all the way up into the Northern Virginia area. Um, and our district is carved out of the Shenandoah Valley, which is this red square right here. So we pretty much run the 81 corridor down to about Lexington and Covington. So between the two mountain ranges, we have all the resources within those areas to manage. And mine specifically, um, as was mentioned, are the, the Shenandoah River system basically, and then um, our small impoundments that we have, Frederick, Lara, Arrowhead. Uh, we have some great resources. We've got you know, loads of warm water species like largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, channel catfish, uh, we even have some pretty big musky and a, a pretty decent walleye population that's starting to come on in the main stem Shenandoah. When you think about the western part of Virginia, obviously you think about trout. Um, that's uh, our bread and butter. And so we have a lot of stock trout waters, uh, which I'm involved with um, helping out coordinating some of that stocking, uh, as well as uh, working on um, the wild trout waters that we have, the brook trout waters and so forth. So. Uh, I get to mess around with a little bit of everything um, in, a, in a year's time. Uh, the great thing about this job is that it's always changing. So you get kind of sick of one thing and you move on to another. Uh, in the fall, we're typically working on uh, some of our major smallmouth rivers, uh, sampling those populations. 
Uh, now that we're transitioning in the winter time, we're actually able to take a little bit of a breather and we get caught up on some of the data that we've collected, write some reports, uh, shoot some videos, um, and do some outreach work, uh, as well as just plan for the upcoming year. And then in the spring, it kind of starts all over again, lots of outreach. Uh, we start doing uh, trout work. We do a lot of stocking, of course. Uh, we, we start sampling some of our smaller rivers, uh, like the North Fork, and then the summer, we transition to all trout work all summer long. You know, we're, we're sampling the brook trout waters in the mountains. So um, that's the basic gist of, of, of our fisheries work. Uh, there's a lot more mixed in there, but those are the biggies uh, that we work on. Um, I'm also pretty passionate about outreach work. You know, I, I try to provide content to our social media pages, which are on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, um, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. And uh, I'm also part of the DWR fire crew, uh, and I've gotten pretty hooked on some early successional habitat restoration uh, that our wildlife folks work on. Uh, my background is not um, specifically with fisheries. I went to school at California University of Pennsylvania and majored in fish and wildlife biology. And so I could have gone really either way. And, and so I like to, to venture out and, and work kind of scratch that conservation itch with, with some of our wildlife habitat work that we do. Um, so it's, uh, it's a little bit of everything. It's always something new and that's what makes this job the best. So today we're gonna to talk about the way we collect data on the North Fork Shenandoah River and how we monitor it. Um, and then, you know, specifically for the game fish populations. Uh, and then we'll also talk a little bit about the smallmouth bass young of the year study that we conducted um, on the North Fork, South Fork, Main Stem, and Mari and the James River as well. So the main way that we sample the, the rivers in our district is through a process called electrofishing, which is literally putting electricity into the water, electric current. Um, pictured here is our shocking raft, and on the back of the raft behind me, uh, behind the oars, is a generator and then the electrofishing box, which allows us to dial in that current so that we stun the fish, but we don't kill the fish. Um, the probes at the front of the raft are where the fish pop up when we're sampling. Uh, and the field's only about eight feet by eight feet, um, you know, in, in diameter and depth. So we have to basically sample where you guys are fishing. Um, it, we can't just magically go out in the middle of the river and just expect all the fish to come up, we have to actually target quality habitat. And that gives us a, a picture of what the fish population looks like. Historically on the North Fork, we've used uh, John boats and those worked well. Um, we, were, we were limited in where we could put those crafts into the river. And so we we're only able to, to sample dam pools or just large natural pools. And that provided some pretty good data um, but as you can imagine, a lot of the smallmouth uh, really were in the faster moving water, the riffle run pool complexes, more so than just the straight pools where you, you tend to find more largemouth species. Uh, and then it just gets too deep to where, again, you can't really sample it effectively. So when we got the raft in 2013, we did some experimenting with it and we found that we really got a better picture of the population uh, by doing these six mile floats. And so we have three reaches that we use the raft on. That's New Market to Quicksburg, that's our upstream reach. Burnshire to Pews is our middle reach. And then Deer Rapids to Strasburg is our low, uh, our downstream reach. Uh, and so those are the ones that we've been monitoring for the past three years, or sorry, since 2013, it's been longer than that. Um, new to this year, we've done some backpack electrofishing. It's basically, the raft all wrapped up into one little backpack. And, and this is our main tool that we use to sample our trout waters. Um, but we uh, were using it this year at some of our access points to target young of the year smallmouth bass to conduct some fish health assessments. And I'll go into that a little bit more detail in the end. Feel free to put questions in the chat during the presentation. I won't get to them while I'm talking, but I don't want you guys to forget something until the very end. You know, we're, uh, we're gonna look back through the chat as we go and we'll, we'll pick off those questions. So um, feel free to add them as we go here. During raft sampling, we're mostly focusing on game fish. 
uh, largemouth bass, red breast sunfish, smallmouth bass, musky, and rock bass. Uh, that's pretty much the bread and butter for the North Fork. We'll also find some black crappie every now and then, um, a few other different species of sunfish like bluegill and green sunfish. Um, but that's the main, uh, the main course for, for the river. Uh, and we conduct uh, four samples per, per six mile reach. And those uh, are 30 minutes each. And so we collect um, two game fish runs, we call it, where we, we capture all of the game fish um, and then two bass only runs where we just focus on bass exclusively. There are you know, plenty of non-game fish out there, believe it or not, channel catfish are not considered a game fish. Um, to me, they are, but we have a very good channel catfish population, excellent fall fish, which is a large minnow species. And then we have common carp as well, which is not a native species, but um, there are plenty of them out there. And some people do enjoy catching them. They're tremendous fighting fish. So this is a, a sample of um, our raft shocking. You can see our dipper on the front there, focusing his efforts around those probes. And you can see, um, we just collect as many fish as we can. Uh, there, there is a little bit of, um, there's, a, there's a difference between dippers. You know, some, some are more gung-ho than others. Uh, some see fish better than others. And so that's one of those variables that we try to account for uh, when we're doing our, our population monitoring, we really tried to have experienced netters on the front of the boat. And you can see that we just kind of cruise into these different eddies, you know, the same spot where you'd cast a bait, that's where we're trying to focus our efforts. And then we move on downstream um, and continue our work. Again, we're, we're trying to catch as many as we can, but at the same time, we understand that the dipper can only grab so much and it's, it's just a sample of the population. We don't get a population estimate by doing this. It's just a snapshot. Once we um, capture the fish, we identify each one, measure them to the nearest millimeter, and then weigh them to the nearest gram. And uh, you can see that there's quite a few fish in the cooler here after a half hour run. And you know the best part is they're no worse for wear. I mean, as soon as you're weighing them, they're flopping around, giving you trouble. Um, sometimes you wish you turned up the shocker a little bit more so that they weren't flopping as much. Um, but you can see there's very low mortality in this type of work, uh, which is exactly what we want. Uh, we don't want to hurt the fish. And so this is an excellent way for us to collect them. Much better than me trying to catch them with rod and reel, that's for sure. So um, once we dive into the data a little bit, I'm going to use some different terminology. So I just wanted to explain that really quick. Um, and the one thing I'll be talking about is PSDs or propor proportional size distributions. And this is basically a value that is placed on um, a specific size fish. So um, each game species has their own individual um, metric, so to speak. You know, back in the day, they determined that, you know, a smallmouth bass was considered an adult when it was at seven inches. And so that's the stock category for smallmouth bass. And then they determined that anglers, um, Anglers agree that fish over 11 inches are quality fish. So that's the second category. And anglers prefer fish that are 14 inches and above, and they're memorable when they're 17 inches above and trophy when they're 20 inches and above. And so each fish, even channel catfish, you know, musky, they all have their own set uh, uh, sizes or PSD values. And so when we're talking about smallmouth today, we don't get a ton of the memorable and trophy sized fish. And so I like to use the quality metric because it includes all the fish 11 inches and up. And so it's expressed in a percentage. And so when I say that 43% of the fish in the sample uh, had were quality, that means that 43% of the adult fish, which is the stock fish, are considered quality, if that makes sense. This stuff is hard for me to understand, let alone explain. But um, I think you'll kind of get it as we go, as I show you some graphs. So uh, this is what the, the raft sampling looks like for 2021. Um, you can see that uh, there's three different categories here. New Market to Quicksburg is the uppermost float. Burnshire to Pews is the middle float. And Deer Rapids to Strasburg is the lower float. 
And uh, the, the vertical axis here is it's the number of smallmouth bass that we captured per hour. Sorry about that. The, the blue bars is total CPUE. CPUE means catch per unit of effort. It's basically a fancy word for how many bass we caught per hour of electrofishing. Remember, we do half hour runs. Um, so it's easy to extrapolate that data into an hour. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk about the, the total catch in the blue bars for each one. Um, the red bars are the catch per unit of effort of smallmouth greater than 11 inches. Remember, 11 inches uh, were fish um, over that quality metric. They're considered quality. I like catching 11 inch fish all day. So that's the red bars. And then the green fish are the, the uh, sub adults. You know, they're not ready to spawn yet. They're fish less than seven inches. And so I like to call them future fish. And this is, this is when I say quality fish, this is what I'm talking about. These nice quality smallmouth bass that our technician Zach is holding here. That's what the anglers are after. So we're gonna break it down one reach at a time. Um, you can see that uh, the new market to Quicksburg reach, excellent catch per unit of effort, far and away better than the other two reaches overall. Uh, so when you look at that metric alone, you think, hey, things are great. That's where I wanna go fish. That's, that's the best spot on the river. And that's why we like to break it down into these different categories. Because when you take a closer look, you'll find that the percentage of quality fish is only 9%. So we have a lot of young fish. See this, uh, the green bar here uh, with the fish less than seven inches, quite a few young fish uh, within that uh, part of the river. And so you're not gonna catch real quality sized fish when fishing in the upper river. However, it's very good news to see those young fish coming on because those are the fish that you're gonna be catching years from now. Um, and so that's why we like to call them future fish. When you look at the length frequency of, for that specific reach, you can see on the hor horizontal axis, these are inch classes. Uh, so two inches all the way up to 25 inches. And then the, the vertical is the number of smallmouth that we captured within those inch classes. And so when you look at this, you can see that the six to eight inch category is what's driving this, this, uh, this um, specific uh, area of the river. And so again, going back to the previous slide, it's got the best catch rate, but all the fish are six to eight inches. And so a, a fantastic place you know, to take uh, novice anglers fishing. You know, This is one of those areas where you're gonna see three young fish chasing your bait to the boat and one eventually grabs it. Um, but you know, there's a couple bigger fish uh, that fall into the quality category, but for the most part, um, they are uh, you know, kind of the mid range with a few younger fish. Um, so the future looks bright for the upper river, but it's gonna take a few years before you start to see fish into that quality area. The second reach, Burnshire to Pews, is a completely different story. Um, the worst catch rate of the three uh, but man, the quality fish are there. 43% of the adults uh, were considered quality. Um, and so if you're after big fish, you know, that's the place to go. The concerning thing about this float is the lack of young fish. We've definitely missed some spawns, at least within this reach of the river. And so um, that's one thing that we'll be watching closely in the coming years is whether or not they're able to rebound within that stretch of river. They definitely need a good spawn. I'm hoping that they got one off this year, but this is what it looks like. There's big fish, just a few of them. And then there's a few fish just under stock size. Um, and, and that's about it. Uh, there, there's not a lot of numbers of fish there, but man, you can, every, every little pothole that you found that, that we uh, floated into had one or the other in, in those uh, little depressions in the river. Uh, you can see that this, this stretch of river has almost the perfect bell curve, which is what you want with these populations. <clears throat> Lots of fish in that 10 to 13 inch range, nine to 13 inch range with some of those bigger fish, 15 to 18 inches. That's great, but man, we're really missing those younger fish. You know, we, we missed some year classes for a few years. We got a couple, uh, some young fish down here in the three to four inch range, that's good. That'll help, but we could really use a good spawn to, to even out this, uh, length frequency histogram. The final stretch is uh, Deer Rapids to Strasburg, uh, good catch per unit of effort, lots of young fish, lots of sub-adults, man, 
Um, not a good place to go fish for quality fish. Um, again, only 8% of the adults, the ones we did catch, were considered quality. And look at this histogram, good gosh. There is just nothing out there. Um, lots of young fish, which is good. You know, um, tons of that in that four inch category. So the future looks bright, but just overall the fishing in that stretch, um, at least by our sample, does not look great. Um, and we'll talk about uh, some of the reasons why we think that is uh, later in the presentation. Here's some historic trend data. Remember, we started sampling with the raft back in 2013. Um, and I broke up the different size classes of fish into four different categories. Um, seven to 11 inch fish are in the blue, 11 to 14 are in the orange, and then gray is 14 to 17 and yellow is 17 to 20. And you can see why I kind of lump them all into the quality category um, in the previous slides, because we really don't have very many 17 to 20 inch fish. You know, we're talking about a, you know, a tenth of a fish per hour compared to zero, it's really not telling you very much. And so that's why I like to lump those, those larger size ranges into one group because it's just kind of silly to track a tenth of a fish over time. Um, but you can see uh, a couple of different things here. Back in 2013, maybe it was beginner's luck. Maybe the population was this good, but man, we had a heck of a sample that year. Um, followed quickly by, uh, we came kind of back to earth in 2014. Um, and we had some, some issues in 2014. That was one of our years where we uh, documented some fish health issues um, and we lost some fish that year. Um, you'll notice that the blue bar bounces back in 2015. So it doesn't really appear that we've lost um, the entire population, obviously but the, the, uh, the quality size fish really dropped. And that's what we've seen with these fish kills over time is, is the adult fish are the ones that are hammered by it. Whereas the sub adults you know, are able to bounce back and their growth increases. Uh, and they're also more susceptible to our electrofishing raft. Because when you look at uh, the river, those large adult fish that are dominant, you know, they're gonna be taking up the best habitat as far as the hierarchy goes. And they'll push the, the little ones into the periphery. And then just naturally our netters are gonna dip the big fish. You know, it's just, you know, you, you wanna try to be unbiased, but when you see a big fish come up, you're gonna grab that one first. And then sometimes that little one gets away. But when you take that big fish out of the equation, now there's just smaller fish. And so that's why you can see some, you know, a little bit of wonkiness in your fisheries data. Even when we were, you know, experienced a, a fish health issue, you know, the, the, the younger fish bounce back but really it's just, um, they're a little more susceptible to our sampling. But um, the good news is that the population did recover and, and fairly quickly. Um, we, we missed sampling in 2016, which is unfortunate, but you can kind of connect the dots um, that there was a, a, a rebound in the river. And then 2018, um, we had an incredibly high flow year. Um, and you can see that it had quite an impact on the population. When we came back to look at them in the spring of 2019, uh, they, were, they were not there, you know, they were just gone. And we saw this you know, anecdotally, even with the non-game fish species, we weren't seeing as many suckers or chubs or fall fish. Um, it just, the, the high flow events were just intense. And so we are now um, kind of rebounding from that uh, year of high water. And honestly, 2019 wasn't that generous to us either. That was another high water year, but nothing compared to 2018. As you can see here, here's a flow comparison. The left chart is from 2018. The right chart is from 2021. Um, and they don't look all that different when you first look at them, but then you have to look at the orders of magnitude here. 2018, there was almost one, two, three, instances where the high flows almost reached 20,000 CFS compared to this year where we're only touching 9,000 CFS. And this was a little bit of a dry year, but it was, you know, pretty typical for, for the valley. Um, and just, you know, it was running high over a thousand on a regular basis throughout the entire year, even into some of the drier times in the winter. That's just hard on the fish. I mean, it's just, they have to fight that high flow all the time. It's stressful, there's a lot of runoff involved. 
um, it's asking a lot uh, of our fish population. And so you can kind of see um, what they were up against there and, and why we lost some of those fish. Here's some more historic trend data. This is um, the smallmouth bass total catch. Uh, the orange bar is the average catch rate over time. And that's at 63.5 fish per hour. You can see again in 2013, just a, a banner year. Um, I still think it's beginner's luck, but maybe not. Um, you know, the, the drop off in, in 2014 uh, occurs, and then we start to see that slow rebound um, to where to a high in 2017. And then a little drop in 18, and then a big drop from the, the high flows. Um, you know, throughout that whole year. And so now we're bouncing back again, rebuilding the population. The fish are rebuilding it. We're not rebuilding it. We're just watching it happen. And uh, so the hope is that next year, next spring, we'll be back above that orange line again. And we'll start to see some of those larger fish um, growing into that quality size range. Um, some more historic trend data. Um, the young smallmouth bass, they're called young of the year. They're the babies that are born in June of every year. And so these fish, I know I said I, we like dipping big fish, but these fish are just as valuable as the big fish because these fish allow us to predict what fishing will be like years down the road, as long as we know how fast the fish grow um, and at what age. And so um, if we know that there was a great year class in 2015, for example, uh, we know that that fish will grow into X size at Y year, depending on how they grow. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But you can see that in 2013 was a tremendous spawn, 2015, amazing. Those types of spawns can really carry the fishery for years to come. Um, and you can see where we may have missed some spawns back in 17, 18, 19, especially when you look at maybe specific parts of the river, um, you know, so that Burnshire to Pews, you know, it, it may not have, it may have had even worse spawning success than this, uh, than the overall river, because we will see spottiness from, you know, some parts will, will do better than others, you know, depending on where you're at. Um, but the good news is that 2020 and 2021, both above average when it comes to young of the year. And so um, we've got some, some future fish in the system as we kind of talked about earlier with those length frequency histograms. Let's talk about aging fish. How do we do it? Uh, well, we use a structure called otoliths. Um, you can also use scales, but they're not very accurate because they can uh, regrow scales. Um, some fish you can clip off their um, fin rays, uh, like uh, I think you can do it with catfish. We definitely do it with musky. Um, those are species that you know, certain species you're not willing to sacrifice the fish for the otolith, um, so you have to try to use different structures. But at the end of the day, the otolith uh, tells the story. And to extract the otoliths, uh, we have to break in or dissect the fish um, to get to the, the capsule that holds those otoliths. And those otoliths um, are tiny, somewhat transparent um, structures that are made of calcium, and they float in liquid within the fish's head and it allows the fish to sense or to stay um, or to control its equilibrium. So if it shifts to the left, we have otoliths too. When we shift to the left, the otoliths move and we know we're off to the left, we gotta move our fins and get back up right again. So um, the cool thing about otoliths is they put down layers of calcium, just like trees put down rings. And you can look under the microscope, polish these otoliths up and you can count how old a fish is. And then you can determine how fast the fish is growing when you look at the size of the fish compared to its age. And you can see that if you have a 10 year, or a, sorry, yeah, we'll just use 10 years. A 10 year old bass that's only 10 inches long, that's incredibly bad growth. It's really stunted. It's probably in a, a small impoundment like um, Lake Shenandoah where they just, they grow slow as dirt. And so you can make adjustments sometimes uh, to the regulations to try to harvest more fish out of there so that you can thin out the population and have them grow a little faster. Uh, the same thing goes for the river. It's a little bit more of a dynamic system, so it's a little bit different, um, but uh, it, it's very valuable information for us. I don't have a lot of age and growth info on the North Fork, um, so we'll look at the South Fork, which is 
going to be similar. The, the fish in the South Fork are going to grow faster. It's a bigger system with a lot more food. Um, so, you know, maybe add a year to, to each one of these categories. But basically on the horizontal axis, we have years that the fish are living. And then on the vertical axis, it's um, their length in millimeters. The orange line is that um, quality fish line. So that's 11 inches. So you can see that it takes about three to four years for a majority of the fish that we aged to get to that quality size. So again, now that we know that information, we can, uh, we can understand the, type, the fish that we're seeing out there right now. The 2015 year class are the, are the fish that are one, two, three, four, five, six years old. And again, going back, we, we don't have very many fish growing older than seven or eight years old. And you can get bass that grow bigger than that or grow older than that for sure. You know, once you, once you have a 10 year old bass, they're getting pretty old. The problem with this data too, is that we have hearts. We don't want to, we don't want to sacrifice a, a trophy fish for otoliths. Um, even if it means getting that information that we, you know, need so, so much, you know, that we don't encounter very many trophy fish. And so the thought of taking that fish out of the system and, you know, uh, removing that chance for an angler to catch, you know, maybe a fish of a lifetime, it's a hard one to swallow. And so um, oftentimes you'll see missing data points um, with the older fish because we're just, we have a hard time uh, stomaching sampling those trophy fish. Um, but regardless, when you look at the, the uh, historic trend data for the smallmouth, you can see that the 2013 fish, this decent year class that we had back here, there might be some left over in the system, but there's not going to be many. I mean, the fish that Steve's holding here, that big fish, that looks like an old fish. It looks like a grandparent. So, you know, that might have been a 13 fish, but most of those fish have probably aged out of the system now. And the 2015 fish are getting old too. And so, Enjoy those bigger fish, those quality fish while they last. Um, but the good news is in, in most of the situations, there's young fish coming right behind them. And so, um, you know, barring any crazy weather events, you know, we'll, we'll be uh, growing more, more of those uh, trophy sized fish coming up or quality sized fish, I should say. All right, the, the um, one of my favorite fish, the red breast sunfish, our native sunfish. Um, smallmouth are not native to the North Fork Shenandoah. They're a lovely fish, um, but the red breast um, is lovelier because they are our native sunfish and they're gorgeous. Uh, and so we do look after those. Um, obviously they do uh, play a little bit of a second fiddle to the smallmouth because that's, you know, again, the angler's bread and butter, they want to catch smallmouth, but man, pound for pound, if you catch a quality size sunfish, they are going to outfight a smallmouth any day of the week. In the left uh, graph, we have some historic catch rate data. 2021 was fantastic. We had just uh, the best sample ever for red breast sunfish. Um, and that, you know, can be explained in a couple ways. One, the population looks really good. Uh, most likely there's some predator prey dynamics there. When you reduce the, the predators in a system, the prey are obviously going to be very successful. So we're probably seeing some of that after the rebound from 2018 and just not having a lot of, you know, mature smallmouth out there to eat them. Um, but also if we go a little bit later in the spring, because we're waiting for the flows to come up and the, and the temperatures warm up, the red breasts tend to come out of their nooks and crannies a little bit more. They venture out, they come out of the deep pools and, you know, they're more susceptible to our shocking. So again, water temperature, time of year, all variables to our electric fishing data. We try to keep them as consistent as possible. You'll see that on the right graph, um, this is the quality size fish. Uh, a, a red breast sunfish actually doesn't have its own PSD. So I use bluegill sunfish. It's about as close as you can get. Um, and with bluegills, a six inch plus sunfish is considered quality, uh, which I agree with. You know, you get an eight inch red breast sunfish, there's not much better than that. That's just a, a, a hammer of a fish. Uh, you can see that the quality size uh, overall is looking good. You know, after a long decline um, through 2019, uh, it, it seems to have rebounded a bit in 2020 and 21. Again, probably some increased growth there um, with uh, less, less mouths to feed in, in the river. Um, and you can see that if you want to catch quality sunfish, it's that Burnshire to Pew's run float again. 
17 percent of the of the adult fish uh, fall into that quality category with nine and ten percent at the uh, on the other floats uh, which isn't too bad that's uh, those are pretty good numbers you know you can catch some nice sunfish out there again just a great opportunity to get novice anglers or, or young anglers out uh, with a curly-tailed grub and just hammer on some nice sunfish. Okay, time for the bummer part of the presentation. So um, this spring in June, uh, I was tagged on Facebook uh, by an angler who was reporting sick young of the year bass, uh, which was new for us. We have struggled with adult bass um, having uh, morbidity and mortality issues since 2004. Um, but we typically haven't had problems with juvenile fish. So this was uh, really concerning for us because again, this is the future of our, our fishery. Um, and so this was on the South Fork Shenandoah and, and we, they, the angler was seeing um, dead young of the year, um, some that were just kind of listless at the surface, just floating by him and then some with fungus and lesions and, and uh, discolored fins. And so we decided to um, do some sampling for these uh, little guys. And this goes back to the backpack electrofishing. And we sampled the main stem Shenandoah and the South Fork Shenandoah in June. And we targeted the area that the angler was fishing and found some. And then we spread out to other parts of the river and just you know did the entire 100 mile stretch uh, at different sites. And then we moved on to the North Fork Shenandoah. Um, Region two was working on the James and finding similar things. And then on the Mari River, uh, we used that as a control river because it hasn't seen fish kills in the past, but we actually found some funky fish on the Mari as well, which was concerning. Uh, we did 50 meter uh, reaches. We did 13 sites on the North Fork and we were just targeting uh, smallmouth bass However, we did see a few fish like darters and, and blunt nosed minnows that had um, some issues, but um, for the most part, it was the young smallmouth bass that we were finding. This is some of the backpack electrofishing results from the South Fork Shenandoah. Starting on the left side of the graph, this is um, all the way up near Port Republic. Uh, and we sampled all the way down the South Fork to the main stem Shenandoah at uh, Route 7. And so you can see that the upper reaches of the Shenandoah, first of all, you know, they had a massively successful spawn on the South Fork this year. It was really encouraging to see. Uh, and the fish in the uppermost reaches were very healthy, um, minus some of the fish at Elkton, which they happened to sample right below a sewage treatment plant. So take that one with a grain of salt. But for the most part, we didn't really see issues until we were downstream of Luray. You can see the overall numbers of young of the year start to drop off. And then the fish with anomalies, which are in the red, um, start to bump up in those sections. And granted, we did see a lot of fish escaping us. They're not easy to capture when they're this age. Um, they don't recruit to the backpack shocker very well because of the conductivity. And so we were seeing a lot of healthy fish swim away from us. Um, and so the, the fish with anomaly are probably inflated a little bit because they're just too sick to swim away or they're hiding. And so uh, there's a little bit of bias there, but we did catch a fair number of clean fish, as you can see. On the North Fork, we didn't have nearly as much luck capturing them in general. Um, in the upper reach, similar to the South Fork, we did catch more fish, but these bars look real tall and beautiful, but it's only about three fish compared to the South Fork, which had upwards of you know, 15 to 20 plus fish. So fewer on the, South, on the North Fork. Um, the good news was you know, we didn't find a ton of anomalies um, throughout the reach. The bad news uh, is that we really didn't find a lot of young of the year and we really didn't see a lot of the young of the year, uh, especially on some of the downstream reaches uh, where we do need some good spawns. Um, this is a, HE to RI is Headley Bridge all the way down to Riverton. And you can see we didn't find very many at all. Uh, just so happens that the, uh, the blue-green algae was uh, occurring down there, that bloom was occurring. And so you got to wonder if that plays a role in, in the spawning or if maybe they just didn't have a good spawn in general. Across the board, it doesn't really seem like they had a very good spawn, which is unfortunate. But we'll find out next year. 
we sent the fish off both healthy and moribund fish to the Lamar Fish Health Center. It's run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they uh, conduct a wild fish health survey that is free for us to submit fish to. It's federally funded. It's an awesome setup, you know, where they can look at viruses and bacteria. Um, they mostly focus with focus on hatcheries, um, but we are able to send wild fish to get tested um, free of charge uh, to our agency. So we're able to use utilize them quite a bit. Um, I, I haven't gotten a ton of results back from them. It's been a little bit frustrating, to be honest. Um, I got one quick email about some of the uh, the things that they're finding with these fish, and unfortunately, they're you know even with the fish with with obvious fungus and lesions and fin rot, they haven't really found any bacterial pathogens that really stick out. Um, typical to our fish kills, it seems like it's um, you know a lot of secondary uh, fungus and bacteria that are attacking the fish when it's been weakened. And so the one thing that uh, was interesting was they were positive for a largemouth bass virus. And on, in the, the, the chart here on the right, you can see South Branch Shenandoah. That's actually South Fork Shenandoah. Most of the downstream stretches positive for LMBV. Um, the middle stretch, a little bit of both, positive and negative, main stem positive. And then North Fork uh, had two positives and a negative. Um, that's seven bends and red banks. Uh, and again, we didn't have a lot of fish to send to them, so that was a little tough. And on the James River, they were also positive for LMBV. So largemouth bass virus, why is it in our smallmouth? Good question. Um, a little bit of background, um, it's uh, the only known virus that can cause mortality in largemouth, and it typically affects trophy size individuals. So back in the 90s, when it first started to pop up, Obviously, anglers were freaking out, as, as well as biologists, when they were finding some of their trophy-sized bass floating at the surface of the, of the water. They typically don't have a lot of lesions on them. Um, it, it's just kind of a mysterious virus that, that attacks the, the equilibrium of the fish. Sometimes they'll have lesions on their air bladder, um, but then when they look at some of the studies, they'll find fish that are negative for LMBV, and they'll find lesions on their air bladder. It's kind of a mysterious illness. Um, some studies indicate that maybe water temperature is a driving factor, which obviously is concerning with, you know, climate, climate change going forward. Uh, but the good news is that uh, they can develop some resistance to the, the virus, and it seems to pass over time. And although it's been cultured in other warm water species, um, there's still research that needs to be done on the effect on smallmouth bass. I think there's been some studies that have shown mortality with smallmouth, but I don't know that they've done a lot of work with young of the year. So how it's impacting our young fish uh, is still kind of a mystery, uh, but it's something that we want to keep our fingers on. A little bit of history on the Shenandoah River watershed. Um, back you know, in the early 2000s, our state did some extensive testing for largemouth bass virus, and they, the Shenandoah River and the main stem did, uh, it, it tested uh, negative in 2001, I assume it's the main stem, it just said Shenandoah River. Um, and then in the South Fork, it tested positive. So it has been around for quite a few years. It's obviously not the direct cause of the fish kills because we had fish kills before 2011. Um, the North Fork was never tested and it's now uh, a positive uh, test, obviously. So that's uh, some in interesting information for us just to know that it is present now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's unclear whether or not this is the direct cause uh, of, of the mortality and, and, and sickness in the smallmouth. And my question is, um, do we see this every year? You know, when, in June and July, we're not typically sampling the river, we're sampling trout streams. And so it's possible that we have seen some of these events um, maybe in the past couple of years, uh, maybe sporadically through the past 10 years. Uh, it's unclear, but um, going forward, we will be continuing to sample um, the sites that we've done and try to develop some trend data over time. And, and we'll see if um, we can get some long-term data on these young of the year and see if maybe, uh, for example, on the South Fork, if we're just seeing it downstream of Luray, you know, we can kind of focus our efforts in trying to figure out what's happening with these fish within that stretch of river rather than, you know, 
surveying the entire reach. I'm not, I'm not gonna go too much into blue-green algae. I'm not the algae biologist, I'm the fish biologist, but it definitely plays a role. And I know you guys are gonna have some speakers coming up um, that will, will speak on this, I'm sure, um, and, and do a much better job than I will. But just some, a little bit of uh, background. Um, blue-green algae is not a plant, it's a bacteria called cyanobacteria, single-celled organism. And they uh, naturally exist in fresh waters. It's not some crazy invader. Um, that's that's ruining all, all our river, um, but basically it lies in wait uh, for situations when there's lots of nutrients available, which, as you all know, um, our our rivers in the valley are full of, um, and we have very low warm water conditions. Obviously, that is just you know the recipe for for one of these giant blooms, um, and so you know it, it typically occurs in the in the summer months and uh, and then starts to taper off. Uh, once the, the algae have kind of run through their natural cycle and, and things start to get cold again. The interesting thing about blue-green algae is that it does give off some toxins, which you're all aware of. Um, two of the main ones that um, some research has been done on are microcystin and anatoxin A. And the biologists in West Virginia have had similar problems with some of their fish species um, even going beyond smallmouth bass. And they've studied um, quite a few samples of, of fish over there, and they did find levels of microcystin and anatoxin in um, the diet, the liver, and the gut of, of their smallmouth bass over there. And so um, I don't know, that they've never, I couldn't find anything that they've published on, on the research that they've done. So I don't know if they can really say that this is the direct cause um, to some of the mortality that they saw over there. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, you look back at that graph earlier where we didn't find any young of the year downstream of Headley, you know, it just so happens it's, you know, right in the heart of the blue-green algae bloom. There may be, there may be uh, some issues there. We may have saw, uh, or we may have experienced some mortality due to toxicity with the blue-green algae, but again, when you don't catch any fish, it's kind of hard to, to, to test them. Um, so that, that makes it a little bit challenging, but um, it's definitely something for us to consider going forward. Uh, the fish health with the, Shen oops, with the Shenandoah River is, is tough. It's, it's, it's best described as death by a thousand cuts. You know, we found fish with um, containing neonicotinoid pesticides we found fish that have incredible parasite loads on their gills and on their livers. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of herbicide runoff. There's way too many nutrients. Uh, we have temperatures increasing um, and we have toxic algae. <laughs> so it's just one thing after another. But uh, the bottom line is, although it can be sad um, when we experience these uh, um, runoff events and some of these fish health issues, uh, our, our populations can continue to persist. We have a, a diverse fishery um, that is available to everyone. Uh, and we have an improving bass population going forward. And so, um, you know, organizations like Friends of the North Fork are the future uh, and Shenandoah Real Women are the future. You know, those are the organizations that I'm passionate about partnering with. Uh, you're the voices of the community. Um, you, can, you, can dis you can talk with people um, better than I can about protecting our watersheds and, and trying to prevent some of these non-point source runoff um, events. And so, uh, and, and you're also the ones that are gonna be teaching the anglers of the future. I mean, uh, we, we do our fair share of outreach and events, but um, we need to continue to partner with organizations like you to get more fishing rods into people's hands so that they become passionate about fish conservation like you all are and just river conservation in general. Um, I'd like to give you guys uh, a pat on the back for coming to Rio Palooza this year. That was excellent to see you there. Um, a little bit of a tough event with, with the pandemic going on, uh, but again, just showing up is, is great to support um, diverse communities throughout the Valley. And hopefully we can build on some of that, uh, those good vibes going forward. Uh, and we continue to, to put more river access on the North Fork the South Fork, you know, is, is 
the dream. You know, it's got just so much river access broken up into really uh, user friendly floats. And that's what I'd like to see on the North Fork Shenandoah too. So um, keep your ears to the ground when it comes to potential access um, and let us know when, when you find those opportunities because we would love to try to, to work out something to get some different properties. For those of you who don't know, um, our agency, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, uh, is the state wildlife agency, and it's mostly funded by license sales. So fishing, hunting, and, and the few trapping licenses we sell still um, are what fund this agency, along with boat registrations um, and the, uh, the newer access pass. Um, we also get um, some federal funds uh, which come in the form of an excise tax from manufacturers when you purchase, um, you know, hunting supplies and fishing supplies as well as fuel, and we're able to get that federal grant money uh, doled out by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it equals better fishing, hunting, and boating. And so, um, the best way to support our agency is is through a license sale, um, so that we can get you know some of that federal uh, federal money. You can also volunteer for our agency, become a complimentary workforce volunteer. We have quite a few that help us stock trout and do some other things. Um, and then of course, become a partner with our agency, which you guys are pretty much already linked in. We have a really cool um, Restore the Wild membership now uh, for those of you looking to give back directly to conservation. Um, the Restore the Wild Fund is was developed to create habitat for wildlife. So that's anything from planning habitat for pollinators um, or restoring a stream, you know, creating habitat for, for brook trout or something like that. Um, our staff are able to, um, you know, create pitches for that grant money and we're able to put some good um, habitat on the ground for all sorts of wildlife, with both game and non-game species. I have QR codes here, um, which is this guy on the left. Uh, if you scan that QR code with your with your camera on your phone, don't take a picture of it, just scan it. Um, a website will come up directly for that. And you can get a membership. There's like different levels. Um, might be a good Christmas gift this year, just saying. We also have a Virginia Wildlife Grant Program. This one I'm really passionate about because it's literally getting youth into the outdoors. And so um, teachers or, or groups like the Friends of the North Fork can apply for to this grant program and you can get fishing rods for kids fishing events. You can get binoculars or journals, anything that's gonna connect um, the kids with the outdoors. And the way that we fund that program is through Shop DWR among other partners um, where we have some great merchandise. Again, you know, going back to uh, uh, Christmas time, there's some pretty cool stuff for, for the outdoors man or woman in your, in your family. Uh, we've got some pretty cool bags now in there. And so, you know, it's, it's a great cause to give back. My family is so sick of DWR swag for Christmas. It's just, it was an easy out for me for many years. I, I don't think I can use it anymore, but you guys can. Uh, we also have an app in case you've been living under a rock. Um, go grab that. You can uh, just download it off the, um, the app store. Just slipped slip in my mind where, you, where it's called Go Outdoors Virginia. You can store your license on it. Um, and you can purchase licenses as well and find some other fun things like sunrise, sunset, stuff like that. Okay, try the Virginia Trout Slam out. It's uh, the challenge to anglers were to catch all three trout species in one day. There's a, a, a great uh, page on our website. You just um, Google Virginia Trout Slam VDWR, it'll pop up and you can check it out and you can get a cool sticker like the one you see here. All right. That's it. That's my pitch. Question time. Thank you, Jason. Um, yeah, so if you haven't already asked questions, please do. You can send them in the chat box. But Okay, let's take a look here. Um, what are some of the bycatches or surprising species that you've found when population monitoring in the North Fork? I've seen very large mad toms and American eels in the North Fork. Um, that's correct. Um, in fact, I, I was shocked this year with the amount of margin mad toms on the Deer Rapids float. Um, margin mad toms are a native catfish. They're, they're small, they grow about you know six inches at the, at the biggest. They're unique because they have a little toxin 
that's located in the spines of, of their uh, pectoral and dorsal fins. And a lot of people think that catfish whiskers sting you. They're not uh, at all dangerous. They, they're just for feeling, there's no sting involved, but it's those spines and the pectoral and the dorsal fin that can get you. And the mar margin man top can actually sting you. Kind of feels like 20 bee stings in the same spot. Um, doesn't feel great. Ironically, the smallmouth love margin mad toms. They are just candy to, to smallmouth. And so it's a great bait to use. Um, we do see eels periodically. Uh, probably the most surprising thing I've found was a gar on the, on the Burnshire float. Um, not native to the river. Somebody dumped the gar in there. And so uh, it was probably about three feet long. So that was surprising. Um, other than that, no surprises, which I like because usually a surprise means someone dumped a fish that's not supposed to be there. Oh, sometimes we see koi. That's kind of surprising. <clears throat> Are those numbers or fish or mass? Ooh, tough one. Um, it's the, we, we didn't talk about weight at all when, when we're talking about the, uh, the, the different graphs that I was showing. It's, uh, it's numbers of fish. Uh, the catch per unit of effort is number of bass per hour. And then I broke those down into different categories. Is it true the state is considering stocking smallmouth bass via the Passage Creek fish hatchery when that reopens? It, it is true. Um, part of the settlement um, from the DuPont uh, plant in Waynesboro, um, you know, polluting the river with mercury, uh, is that we will be replacing recreational fishing loss with fish. Um, there were many, many ideas on how to do that. Uh, this one was decided by people much higher in the ranks than, than myself. Um, but at the end of the day, um, some money was set aside to restore four ponds at the Front Royal Fish Hatchery, um, which will be used to, to experimentally raise smallmouth bass. Um, our focus for that project will be South River because that's the main river that was affected with the mercury. Um, and that's gonna be kind of our experimental river to see how successful it is um, by stocking these fish. And if we have enough fish, we'll also be looking at the South Fork as well, because again, that, that river was damaged um, um, from mercury. And we'll be monitoring this for, for many years to determine whether it's effective or not. It's gonna be a very, very much a long-term study um, many other states are looking to do the same thing and have already started raising smallmouth. They're notoriously challenging to raise, so there's going to be a learning curve, um, and there'll be good years and bad years. Um, but going forward, we need to have um, a stocking option for some of our resources because um, some of the habitat's becoming too degraded. Um, we're having you know, fish health issues. For example, with our young of the year this year, which is going to affect our year class. So it may be a case where we need to protect the fish from the elements until they grow to a certain size and then introduce them to the population to create some recreational fishing opportunities. Um, so that project is very much um, kind of, it's not in its infancy, there's been a lot of work that's gone into it behind the scenes, but we're not going to see a lot of results from that until, you know, many years down the road. The hatchery is not going to be ready until the fall of 2022. So we won't be able to put brood fish into that hatchery until the spring of 2023. Fingers crossed, all things are, are going well. More river access at Deer Rapids means more people fishing, canoeing, intertubing, et cetera. Stress the fish. Um, you're right. Um, we're always balancing that uh, tipping point between you know too much pressure versus too little pressure. We're seeing more and more uh, non-consumptive users using the, our rivers and lakes, which means, you know, the inner tubers, the canoers, the kayakers that are just out there for recreation. And that's why we developed that access pass, because they do have an impact on the resource. They have an impact on our facilities. And a lot of times they don't have fishing and hunting licenses. And so the goal was to have them, you know, pay to play rather than riding on the coattails of the hunters and anglers that were basically footing the bill to create these access points and maintain them. Um, unfortunately, that access pass stalled a little bit for our, um, for our river systems. And so we have some signs up, but we kind of tabled that for now. So it's a little bit of a complicated issue, but 
I think at some point they are going to figure it out and, and they will, um, it'll, it'll be pretty ubiquitous across the Commonwealth. But, but yeah, you know, that's um, the more traffic you have on the river, um, the more spooked the fish will be, but over time they become used to that. And, you know, on the South Fork, we've had tubing companies for many years now and, and you see the fish kind of move out of the way and then they move right back as soon as the tubes go by. And so they kind of get used to the fact that the tubers really aren't a threat. And so probably at first the, the fish would get a little spooky with the splashing and stuff, but they get used to it. Um, I knew somebody would ask about rock bass. Do you have any population data on the rock bass? I actually did just for you, Dave. I looked at the rock bass data. Unfortunately, we caught so few this year that it wasn't worth even putting together a, a graph for it. Um, rock bass are notoriously picky when it comes to water quality. And over time, we have seen less and less uh, in, in our you know, Shenandoah River watershed. Uh, if you want to catch rock bass, the Mari River is the place to go. Um, the, uh, the James River drainage, especially in the upper reaches uh, with the cow pasture and the, and the Jackson and the Mari, you know, just lots and lots of rock bass. They're just cleaner resources. You know, they have fantastic habitat. Um, where I see rock bass on the Shenandoah River is where we have some grass or we have some um, dynamic rock outcroppings. Um, they don't seem to be a huge fan of just the standard bedrock veins that you'll see some of the red breasts and the smallmouth coming out of on the Shenandoah. Um, and it's just, there's just, a, a, it's very eutrophic. There's a lot of nutrients in the Shenandoah. It's just not as clean a river as, as they would prefer. We, we actually did see quite a few rock bass with lesions and um, in a lot of stress when the fish kills started. So I, I think they've had a hard time coming back from that compared to the smallmouth and the red breast. And in what ways could humans help in maintaining habitat and great growth conditions in the river, perhaps to combat some unpredictability in annual weather? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the best thing we can do for the river is to create robust riparian areas. Um, the riparian area is the vegetated buffer that grows next to the river um, that has a lot of mature trees, um, you know, mid-successional shrubs, um, and then some early successional grasses and, uh, and, and forbs. And not only are you benefiting the river, but you're also benefiting uh, the wildlife as well. You know, our, our big game species love moving through those corridors. Um, our neotropic migrants that, that come down through those gorgeous warblers, uh, orioles, they love those riparian areas. You can hear the orioles in the spring singing in the, in the, in the sycamores of the North Fork Shenandoah. And so, you know, um, not only creating riparian areas along the, the main stem of the North Fork, but we, we, we really have some pretty good um, riparian areas on the North Fork itself. It's really the small tributaries when you get away from the North Fork um, that are really denuded by um, urbanization um, and then agriculture as well. You know, we have to fence out our livestock from these rivers. Uh, we have to try to avoid using the mower and just allowing these ditches, smaller streams, first order and second order streams to grow up into a nice rushy riparian area so they can soak up some of the contaminants that are coming off the, the land as well as um, some of the nutrients. And that, that goes back to us again, like we need to really monitor our use of herbicides and fertilizers. You know, everyone loves the, the green English yod, but you know, it's just unnecessary. And, we, and we've gotten to a point now where we're at a tipping point and, and our wildlife are starting to suffer. And so it's, it's time for us to do better. And so using simple things like using less water, especially during dry times of the year, um, you can see uh, numerous irrigation points along the Shenandoah River um, that are really using a lot of water to, to water our, our corn and soybeans in the valley. Um, and so, you know, we need, need as much water going to the river as we can. It's so surprising I catch rock bass in North Fork and South Forks, Passage Creek and Stony Creek. Yeah, Luke, they're, they're there. Um, yeah, it's not that the rock bass aren't there. It's just that their numbers aren't what they used to be. That's all. Awesome. Um, sorry for my silence earlier. It's almost two years into Zoom calls and I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> oh, um, shoot. Yeah. Anywho, uh, 
Thank you all for sending in questions. If you have any more, definitely either pop them in the chat in the last couple of minutes, or I'm putting a message in here with Jason's email. Um, and then if you have any questions specific to the presentation, but if you have any questions about the lecture series in general, you can contact me at my email here in the chat as well. Um, and I've, uh, Jason's just transitioned to a slide showing some upcoming events. So we have three more lectures in this lecture series. Oops. Definitely check those out. Um, we'll be talking about LG, public health as it relates to LG, and then the regional supply plan for um, the Northern Shenandoah region. We also have some workshops and other events coming up. So in reference to one of Jason's last points, um, water conservation is certainly important and doing that in your home can be helpful too. We have a couple rain barrel workshops coming up and that's one simple way you can, you can help do that. Um, also, the recorded version of the lecture will be available on our website and YouTube channel in the next week or so. Um, so if you enjoyed today's lecture, want to see it again or share it with friends, definitely do that. And if you aren't a member, again, we encourage you to see what we're all about and um, check out what we're about on our website at fnfsr.org. Um, thank you so much, Jason, and we hope you have, everyone has a wonderful evening. You're welcome. Thanks so much, everybody, for having me. Let me know if you have any questions. Oh my gosh, one of the my old technicians is on here. Hi, Braden. Bye, Braden. Bye, everybody.